thank you very much for joining us uh, at uh, UNU for this public conversation with Professor Kichi Fujiwara, who's director of the Institute for Future Initiatives at the University of Tokyo. Uh, you've all seen more about him on the invitation uh, to this conversation, so I won't waste his time telling him about himself. But what I will ask him first is to tell us a few words uh, about his new institute at the University of Tokyo, which cuts across and brings together many of the faculties and academic groups at the University of Tokyo. So Kichi, might you say something about that? Uh, thank you, David. It's a great honor to be on in this United uh, Nations University Virtual Conversation Series. And I really appreciate uh, Rick, Rick de Malone uh, to invite me not only to con make contributions, but also to speak about our institute, uh, which is called Institute for Future Initiatives, um, IFI. The only way you can pronounce it is IFI. And, and I guess that is um, quite appropriate when we talk about the future. We don't really know what's going to happen. But nonetheless, uh, a couple of things. Uh, one, the university uh, is an institute for, institution for research and education, but not necessarily uh, one that would serve public goods. Uh, we have our own research agenda. We need to publish. Uh, we need to teach. But we're not really sure if we're making a difference in the world. So we wanted a, a sort of an institution that would um, um, be clear in its objective that we have to uh, make contribution to the world. Um, um, a connection with the society is essential. Um, you might call it a think tank, uh, but um, and then comes the second and very different uh, character. Think tank is all about policy in the short range. You can't really talk about a long range perspective. And uh, when it comes to short range, university can compete with think tanks. What we wish to do uh, is to start from an image of the future. Um, what some people call backcasting. Show an image. As a matter of fact, uh, SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, is a perfect case of backcasting because it's a whole Christmas tree of agenda that the global society should accomplish. So um, thinking about the future, a long range um, scheme and uh, see what we can do. Um, and the more immediate um, need was to bring all the forces in the university together. The University of Tokyo, to be very frank, is not really a university. Um, it's a group of um, independent institutions that have their own agenda. And the research um, is not really, um, doesn't really have the connection. So we need a hub uh, in the university with the leadership from President Gonokami. Um, he started the Future Society Initiative, um, well, using many of the goals uh, listed in SDGs. And um, somehow our Institute for Future Initiatives uh, was um, was made to bring things together and make a difference. Um, our goals um, go on. Um, it includes the aging society, um, traditional and non-traditional security. But right now, we're paying great attention to sustainability uh, for obvious reasons. So uh, thank you, David. That's what we're doing. Uh, but I guess I shouldn't use too much time away uh, for my propaganda. Uh, Not to worry, your propaganda is of interest to us all because this is actually a major development at the University of Tokyo, which is a field le leader in Asia and globally uh, on academic initiatives. Now let's jump into the heart of our agenda, which is the process of internationalization, which uh, essentially began, I suppose, with the creation of a variety of international organizations during and right after the uh, Second World War. 
uh, and then became a project really of economic globalization, which Japan played a very major role in, uh, and which in a sense, Japan's economic success and further potential allowed it to become a major international actor. And so I wondered if you'd tell us a bit about all of that, and then I might ask you about how Japan came to contribute very significantly to the development of the concept of human security. Thank you for the question. Uh, inter internationalization is a rather tricky subject for Japan because Japan was not part of the European um, uh, world, uh, which had already constructed um, a certain international society, um, perhaps not with institutions, but nonetheless, uh, there was a concept of Europe that emerged after the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, there was always this discussion about the extending rule of law in the international sphere. And I dare say that Japan was part of this process even before the Second World War, uh, as you can see um, in the role of um, Prince Sionji in the Paris Peace Conference, uh, there was quite a few Japanese who were educated along um, the, um, uh, the lines of well, Western um, style of political institutions, international, internationalization, uh, but um, this was limited. And of course, um, especially in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, Japan started to assert herself as a major military power. Uh, without uh, much attention to international cooperation. And um, the sense that the war the Japanese started brought up hardship to the Japanese society uh, was the very beginning um, of the internationalization that we see today. Um, the focus was on the economy, to be sure, for the economy had to be reconstructed uh, but also um, because Japan was not to be a major military power. Um, the, if it wishes to be a power, the focus should be on the economy. And another character that is important is the centrality of the United Nations. It is quite strange to see in Japan, which is a close ally with the United States, uh, putting um, Kokuren Gaiko, UN diplomacy, as a major principle of Japanese uh, foreign policy. Uh, that goes back on in the days that Japan was not a member of the United Nations. When Japan joined UNESCO, it was a recognition that Japan is re-entering the world, so to say. And when uh, Japan became a member of the United Nations, I believe in 1956, uh, this was um, rejoining the world in a major way. Now, what role should Japan play? Um, the focus was essentially on the economy. Um, uh, this was a period when um, uh, major Western powers were retreating from colonialism. Uh, but nonetheless, um, the developing world or what we might call global South today uh, needed great economic assistance. And this actually was a way that Japan could um, enhance power and also enhance international cooperation. I believe the beginning was the, uh, was the reparation to uh, Southeast Asian nations, essentially. Uh, Philippines, Indonesia, um, the first was Myanmar, um, and then South Vietnam, I believe. Um, reparation was essentially a form of grant aids. So um, that reparation followed up in, um, in overseas development days, ODAs, and Japan uh, was pretty successful in, um, in using such economic opportunity to enhance cooperation and also um, bring out uh, more market integration. And this went hand in hand with Japan's uh, role in the United Nations. However, Japan's role in international conflict was extremely limited. 
uh, the basis, as I said, was um, well, more or less on the economy, trade, um, uh, development cooperation was the word of the day, but Japan's role in international conflict was somehow um, quite well, weak, ambiguous. And then also um, one um, point that we should consider is, um, is that Japan was not to play a major role in military um, activities. Um, uh, we see a strange combination of pacifism and isolationism uh, in the Japanese interpretation of Article 9, a rather controversial way of putting things. Um, and I dare say that Japan not becoming a major military power was good for the world. We don't really need a new uh, Second World War. But at the same time, and Japan's cooperation in international peacekeeping activities, for example, was extremely limited. So there was a good track record of economic diplomacy, but pretty weak in international conflict uh, management and conflict res resolution. And that's where I believe uh, your second question, human security, uh, comes in. But I guess you have to ask the question. Well, I thought I'd situate it. Uh, in the 1990s, after the end of the Cold War, many things that would have been impossible during the Cold War of absolute confrontation between the Soviet Union and the Western powers became possible because the Russian Federation was much more open to uh, cooperation, including cooperation on ideas with other countries, including Japan. And uh, new concepts emerged, one of which during the 1990s was human security. And it got started in effect by initiatives that were driven by the Nordic countries, United Kingdom, Canada, my country, uh, that dealt with issues like uh, the elimination of anti-personnel landmines, which were hurting many people after the conflicts that mines had been laid for were, uh, were finished. Uh, it also dealt with the creation of an international criminal court. And uh, so the concept of human security emerged, but as a soft security concept. Uh, I think often the expression soft security was um, associated with it. And Japan entered the fray in a very positive and surprising way, leading an initiative on security that sought to expand the concept of human security. And I wanted to ask you to talk about that a bit. No, thank you um, for an excellent question, really. Um, human security was so important and so easily acceptable for the Japanese. Um, this is about security, but um, this human security is not about um, scaring other nations so that they won't invade or for that matter, take over other people's territory um, for one's defense. Um, in quotation mark. Um, this is not a hardline security idea. The focus was on the lives of people um, who are suffering um, from fear from one, um, poverty and tyranny uh, was, uh, was on a situation that we saw um, at the end of the Cold War. Now the end of the Cold War was a wonderful opportunity in a way because um, there were more nations that shared liberal ideas, institutions, as well as economic policy uh, no longer um, closing their market. So uh, with a commonality of ideas and institution, political or economic or policy, there was a chance for a rule of law in the broader sense in the international sphere even if we don't have a world federation that gives orders or sanctions. So, um, like I said, um, the Japanese diplomacy paid more attention to economic diplomacy, uh, the economy and uh, development issues and uh, security matters were in a way lagging behind. Um, now, 
Human security was an idea that could connect development cooperation and conflict resolution. Um, we could um, provide uh, people um, in a way that they would be fear, uh, free from want. And I believe it's one of the pillars of human security. Um, and also um, give a basis uh, for political stability that would make um, uh, uh, conflicts uh, well um, uh, more limited. Um, so Japan jumped to the concept. And I should also add that this was at the end of economic diplomacy. Um, the nations to which Japan had been so successful in developing cooperation, say Indonesia, Thailand, or Philippines, they were no longer developing nations. They were emerging economies. And that, of course, applies to South Korea. So there was no way that Japan could continue um, the, the old kind of aid policy. The focus was on conflict-ridden regions in the globe, uh, including the Middle East, uh, North and um, uh, South Africa, um, as well as other nations where the United Nations has been playing a great role. So um, human, the idea of human security was easily accepted in Japan, although I should add that the focus was more on um, economy than peace and justice. Um, the Japanese government was extremely reluctant to be engaged in a matters um, field that um, is included in human security, which includes um, strong sanctions against uh, authoritarian regimes. And the Japanese government, in a way, uh, like the Chinese ODAs nowadays, were um, accepting uh, the sovereignty idea much more than uh, the Western society and especially Nordic society. So um, this leads to this uh, rather uh, precarious relationship between the idea of human security and responsibility to protect. Japan was uh, quite uh, reluctant uh, to join the idea of responsibility to protect and did not argue against the International Criminal Court, but nonetheless was extremely careful um, in approaching it. When it comes to peace and justice issue, uh, Japan was not really taking much leadership. But having said that, the economy was essential for human security and the development was lagging behind. So um, I do think that uh, with all those caveats, uh, Japan did um, work pretty well. Um, in the idea of human security. And one final thing, nothing would have happened without Madame uh, Sadako Ogata. Um, the late Madame Ogata was, I don't know how to put it, a, a wonderful woman. I came to respect her, although um, she is straightforward, uh, no small talks. Uh, when my colleague introduced me to Madame Ogata, and uh, told her that uh, he studied, uh, uh, Fujiwara is studying disarmament. Um, you know what she said? Well, then you can go on studying forever. So uh, she's that blunt. Uh, <laughs> but with her straightforwardness, um, she dealt with um, the refugee situation in the post-Cold War world, um, did a marvelous job at the UNHCR, and took the lead in human security. Because uh, if I may put it this way, um, this was the direction that Japan should take. Mm. And I think her view of human security, as I recall, was that uh, through development assistance, it, it should be possible to empower developing countries to play a very positive role in human security. So her later presidency of JICA in a way resulted from her leading with Amartya Sen, the great Indian Nobel Prize winner and economist, a global commission on the concept of human security, which uh, balanced the earlier Nordic and Canadian concept, with the power of economic development to create conditions for human security. 
And that was widely accepted, I think. Now, we should take some questions because I know there are a number of uh, people online who have been wanting to engage you, Kichi. So we'll do that for as long as we can. Absolutely. Thank you, David. I have a question from Otilia Sofron from CBU, Romania. Japan is a special country, and I think one problem today is that the majority of Japanese people are not able to communicate in a foreign language. What are current, uh, current maybe new efforts to address this? Mm -hmm. Great question, and that's what I'm working every day. <laughs> um, uh, most of the classes in the universities were, university was given in Japanese. Uh, but right now, I'm half half. Um, half of my classes are taught in English and half are taught in Japanese. Uh, we have to um, force um, the students um, uh, to understand that, uh, well, English as, uh, as a, is a tool that opens up new horizons. And it's not only about getting good grades and coming to universities. But you see, um, you live in Japan, you speak Japanese, and you have a pretty comfortable life. Um, you can make your living. Um, so the incentive for going global, um, not only learning, but using English is, um, is not enough. Um, although I should quickly add that there is a gender gap here. I see women are more interested in um, using their language skills. Uh, than men, uh, possibly because um, uh, women in Japan see relatively less opportunity for career um, advancement in Japan. And um, the language could be one, um, one tool that you could use. So it's easier teaching uh, women um, in English. Thank you. Dr. Sophia Penyabaz Wiley from Chiba University asks, mm -hmm. What are some ways that you believe Japan can become more internationally active in sustainability now? Oh, that, thank you. Uh, th that's what we're, we're working on right now. Um, sustainability was an area, um, environmental policy, um, uh, environmental technology. Japan was pretty strong in the 1980s and 1990s. And, and then um, Japanese technology uh, went through a relative decline. Uh, uh, when it comes to um, 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 new forms of energy supplies, I believe uh, that, for example, China is doing much better. Um, but uh, what Japan can do um, is to well, collect all the um, technology um, um, in a package um, that is um, related oh, a package with uh, development projects. And um, that is what we're doing right now uh, in Nigeria, I believe. And then also another thing is to set um, global indicators. Now you may have seen um, SDG indicators. Um, there are so many, not really useful um, to be um, very honest. Um, so uh, we uh, brought it down to a bare minimum of global commons. And uh, right now we started a center for, center for Global Commons. It's an international center, it's not only Tokyo. As a matter of fact, it's more international than Japanese to set up um, Global Commons uh, indicators that can be useful for the world. Um, so um, that's what we're doing. Um, I don't know if we're gonna be successful, but, uh, but frankly, I'm pretty happy that I could be at the center um, of such initiative. It's a good life. Thank you. Uh, Hirona Matayoshi from Yokohama National University asks, do you believe that territorial disputes with China, troubles with North Korea, and current uh, US economic relations are reasons enough to warrant retaining US bases in Okinawa? Oh, good question. Um, Two things. Uh, one, I am an unconstructed liberal internationalist, and I am very much opposed to unnecessary wars. And having said that, I do um, also support uh, the, uh, the alliance with the United States, and for that matter, international alliances. And alliances not, uh, not um, 
uh, not an institution that forces us to obey orders from Washington, no. It's an international body that uh, does uh, restrain the activities of major powers as well. Now, Okinawa um, is a case that, uh, where uh, Okinawans uh, paid uh, the most uh, largest sacrifice um, in the stationing of US bases. And I do think this is unfair. Uh, my proposal, uh, which has never been accepted, is to make on uh, all military bases in Japan uh, to be of joint use uh, with uh, multinational armed forces, including, of course, in the United States. Uh, on the other hand, the Futema, Air, uh, Futema Air Base um, should be relocated, relocated um, and, um, and Okinawa should not, should not be the only place that holds U.S. military installations. Um, and when it comes to conflict, uh, uh, bases in Okinawa or, uh, uh, seem to be justified because of this, um, uh, this North Korean crisis or whatever. You have to go into the details. Um, do you really need Marines stationed in Japan? I don't think so. Um, uh, we would need Air Force and Naval bases. Um, the use of Marines is on actual combat. And, and if you think such kind of deterrence is necessary uh, for China or North Korea, you must also be aware that, uh, that military bases can also ignite wars. So uh, we have to be careful about that possibility. And I'm not an anti-military pacifist in, gen in principle, uh, but nonetheless, I would be very careful in connecting the dots there. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sudeep Kumar, affiliated with Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, um, asks, the world is changing at a fast pace, and so are the opportunities and challenges for Japan. How do you see the new era of Japan in the Indo-Pacific region? Ah. Um, if there is anything we can say about um, Prime Minister Abe, uh, well, I, he paid great attention uh, to uh, Japan's relationship with India. And um, I think um, the bilateral relationship between Japan and India has been strengthened remarkably. Now, um, this is in many ways um, important for both uh, nations, which are essentially, excuse my language, bureaucratic states, uh, where the uh, role of the state uh, extended to the society uh, to, uh, um, uh, um, in an impressive manner, let me put it that way. Uh, but um, both India and Japan are changing from traditional bureaucratic state um, to a more um, open and responsible transparent uh, regime. Now that's the good part. The bad part may be that, that that may accompany um, democratic governance that is not ex exactly, exactly liberal. We see an emergence of illiberal democracies in the world, and that um, I, unfortunately I see that in India, and for that matter, in more extreme ways, Turkey uh, or Brazil. Uh, Japan has actually been quite supportive of um, these uh, these regimes, and um, that's a tricky question. You can't really kick out um, those um, great nations just because their democracy has become illiberal. But at the same time, I'm not really optimistic as Madame Ogata in believing that economic development would lead to an opening up um, of political institutions. Uh, as a matter of fact, what we do see is that the more uh, the emerging economies develop, the less internationally engaged they tend to become. And, um, and this is a rather difficult part, but um, uh, Japan should be careful in not encouraging such uh, developments while uh, strengthening ties uh, with emerging economies. And India is a wonderful example. And having said all of that, I do appreciate that, uh, the fact that both nations have a good relationship today. I just wanted to say that uh, we've just run out of time for questions. There's been quite a lot. But these are really great answers and appreciate your answers. Great. 
thank you very much. And uh, Kichi, it was a wonderful tour d'horizon. We could have gone on all evening, but we promise our audience will just do half an hour. And Basilios kept us on our toes uh, to achieve that. Thank you all for joining us this evening. I hope you'll join us again. And Kichi, we're hugely indebted to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, th thank you, uh, Rector Malone. Uh, thank you, Basilio. Thank you, everybody, for this. Um, I wanted to go on. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.